Good afternoon. Welcome to TNC Radio.Live. This is the Truckers Network Radio Show. And now here's your host, Shelly Johnson. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Yes, this is the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio.Live, where we offer the news, sports, traffic, weather, information, and entertainment our commercial drivers want and need. We're a station that serves an audience that specializes in transportation. And although most people don't think of it this way, NASA is also in charge of transportation of a very different kind. There's a whole lot that goes into getting a rocket up in space or astronauts and cargo up to the space station. The flight director has to handle all of the logistics of an expedition. With us today is Chris Dobbins, who's a flight director with NASA. He began his career in 2011 as an intern in the Pathways Intern Program. He started full-time at NASA as a space station environmental and thermal operating systems flight controller in 2014, where he logged over 2,500 hours of console time and served as the lead for the International Space Station Expedition 56 and several spacewalks. Chris holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. He's done a ton of things with NASA, and we wanted to learn more about what a flight director goes through. So we decided to have him on the show. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for being on the show with us today. It's great to be with you and to talk to you today and talk to the audience out there. Excited yeah. to be with you. If you don't mind, how about you tell us a little bit about your background? Where at NASA do you work and did you always want to go into aerospace? Yeah, I, I love this question because I think it uh, resonates with a lot of people who, you know, growing up have a have a dream or an idea of something they want to do. And I was fortunate enough to make that work. Of course, there are a lot of people in my life who made it possible and who helped me along the way. But when I was about 10 years old, I saw the movie Apollo 13 for the first time. And I thought, you know, those people in mission control, they seem to know what they're doing and it looks like a really fun job. And so I never had a desire to be an astronaut. I hate things like roller coasters or driving too fast, but I love the idea of exploration, pushing the, pushing the boundaries or, or, or the horizon. Uh, So I, started to pursue that from about 10 or 11. Of course, you don't know what what that path looks like when they're, when you're that young. But like I said, I had several teachers, my parents, uh, various other family members who, who helped, helped me along the way. So I went to, to college for an engineering degree, like you had mentioned. Then I found my way here to Houston, where NASA's mission control for all of our human spaceflight missions is. And I spent the last... Uh, eight or so years of my career working in mission control as a life support flight controller. So the the console position in the in the control room who's responsible for all of the systems that keep the astronauts alive, whether that's you know the air quality or the water quality, as well as we're our the group I was in was in charge of the emergency response. So if there's a fire on the space station, how do we work through that and keep the crew safe? Um, and then just a few months ago, or earlier this year, I was selected as a flight director uh, to, to lead the teams in mission control. What does a flight director have to do? You probably have to know everything. Yeah, so that's, that's a, a, a fun way to put it. So a flight director actually doesn't have to know anything. Uh, that's the job of the experts around them to get them the information they need. A flight director, of course, knows a lot of things. But the the job of the flight director is ultimately to help the team make decisions and uh, kind of solve solve conflicts when there's a priorities decision to be made and lead the team through a, a, a situation. So you've got experts and everything on the space station around you uh, in, in the room. And those experts on things like power systems or computer systems, we have someone who's in charge of tracking all of the stowage on board, all the bags that have the equipment the crew members need. And the flight director's job is to bring all of that together and help the team work together as one unit and get an answer to the astronauts on board on board the spacecraft. There's a lot that goes into that. And I imagine that it can be really tense and stressful at certain times too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that all of us through the course of training, even the, the junior flight controllers who are in charge of a particular system when they're when they're brand new, uh, get trained in how to deal with that. One of the things that uh, we do really well here is is practice like we like we play. So we have a 
uh, simulator, uh, which is just you know a computer system that that emulates what the space station or any other spacecraft might do. And we then have a control room that looks identical to uh, the the room that we sit in for the the actual space station operations. And we pretend that we're flying the the vehicle. We we do everything the exact same way that we would in real life, almost like a pilot gets in a simulator to practice, you know, before they get into an aircraft. And and through that training, through through living through some of those tense situations in a simulated environment, we we get a feel for what it's going to feel like when when you have a really bad day. Unfortunately, those don't happen all too often. We, we don't have bad days often, but you at least you, you're practiced and you're prepared for when when the bad thing happens. And it always amazes me when I step into a simulation how I feel. You know, the pul the pulse goes up, the the sweaty hands or or you know the the fidgeting starts just the same as it would in real life. So it's a really good practice environment to, to get a feel for what it's going to be like if you do have a bad day. So that way, when it does happen, you know, you've been there. It feels sure. normal, the same way a, a team would practice before a big game. Makes sense. Tom, did you have any questions? Sure. Uh, thanks, Chris, again, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Um, and Shelly mentioned at the beginning that you had a, a, a lot of eyes on time with the consoles. Uh, it's well over 2,000, 2,500 hours. Is that correct? Yeah, just about 2,500 hours of working shifts in Mission Control for mostly the space station. Wow. And so during that time, do you kind of get to know the astronauts and things that they're going to like, dislike, complain? I mean, do you kind of become a um, source of um, help to them in the, you know, in the sense of, uh, you know, they're, they're not comfortable with this or that? Is that something that you interface with them on? So... Yeah, it, it's it's indirect, right? So there's in in mission control, there's only one person who typically talks to the astronauts, right? And we do that by design to kind of funnel all the communication through one person, so it's not you know, just peppering the astronauts by and, and bugging them essentially. And so we funnel that all through the flight director to a capsule communicator, communicator we call it a Capcom, whose job it is to talk to the astronauts. And usually, a Capcom is someone with either actual astronaut experience or someone who's had a lot of experience training astronauts ah. uh, before they fly. So they, they kind of know how the crew thinks and, and how they talk and, and how to, you know, almost get through to them. Uh, but when you've got a six month expedition on board, that's how long space station missions typically last. An astronaut mm -hmm. and their, their crewmates go up for about six months at a time you kind of get a feel for that group of people. Every group of people is a little different. They do things a little differently. And so when you're working in the control room, you learn how, you know, how that crew likes to do things, how they, how they approach their job. If they're kind of jokesters or if they're more serious, you know, it's all over the map, different, different personalities. One of my favorite stories to tell is one of the things my console was responsible for, uh, the, the old, the old position I had, the life support systems was, we were the crew's thermostat. So from the ground, if the crew wanted a change in the temperature somewhere on board the space station, it was actually our console's job to click some buttons on a computer to change the temperature on board the space station. So the crew would call down and say, hey, can you make it two degrees colder? And we, we got it to the point where with some crews, we would know at nighttime they want it colder and daytime they want it warmer. So we'd set up you know, a, a routine on console that will just do that when they when they <laughs> Go, go to sleep and when they wake up and they don't even have to worry about it anymore the same way your thermostat on the ground would do that for you at, at home if you have a programmable thermostat. So there's little things like that, that that we do, you know, to your to your question that we do to you know, help help them get along since they're living up there and working hard. Sure. Sure. Uh, one of the things that struck me, I've, I've had an opportunity to, to visit there a couple of times, is they're not on Houston time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So the, the space station is a partnership between the uh, Russian Federation, the European Space Agency, which compromises most of the European Union, and the Japanese space agency called JAXA, uh, and as well as a few other member countries. And you know, kind of as a compromise, picked a time in between. We picked uh, Greenwich time or Zulu time, you know, the, the time often militaries use that cuts through the middle of the UK. So they're about, 
I think five hours ahead of us right now. So for the astronauts, it's uh, eight or nine o'clock uh, compared to, you know, I'm in Houston, it's three o'clock right now. So right. They're, they're a little offset from us, but we kind of split the middle between all of the partners to to, to cause everyone to suffer equally, I guess. Right, in right, terms right. Of that, it, it, equally, the time change. Equally inconvenient for everybody. That's, so, that's right. Right. <laughs> We have to go to break, Tom. I know that there's a lot more we want to ask Chris, but I thought maybe we could go to commercial break and then we can uh, ask some more details. Uh, I want to know how all this works. I mean, I'm, I've always been curious, and NASA is so cool. Well, can, uh, we're talking with Chris Dobbins. He's a flight director at NASA. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio Live. Stay tuned for more coming up. This blog on TNC Radio Live is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app. The Truckers Network.net. Health tips every trucker should follow. When you live your life on the road, it can be very easy to fall into an unhealthy lifestyle. This is the case when it comes to most truck drivers. Being on the road for weeks at a time can take a toll on one's health. The lack of exercise, sleep, and access to a balanced diet are all common health hazards for truckers. Taking care of your health is not only important for your well being, it's also important for a successful career in the trucking industry. Here's some tips every trucker should take into consideration while traveling on the road. Eat healthy. Although it may be more convenient to eat fast food or grab something quick at a gas station, try stopping at a grocery store and picking up some fresh fruits and veggies. Some other healthy options are protein bars, dried fruits, nuts, and make sure to drink plenty of water. If your truck has an auxiliary power unit or power inverter, look into getting a portable stove, crock pot, or microwave. This will make eating healthy much easier, and it also helps save money. Be sure to be aware of your company's policies for cooking in your truck. Exercise. Finding the time to exercise can be quite a challenge when you spend 10 or more hours a day driving. Finding a little time to exercise each day can improve your physical and mental health. Walking, running, pack some running shoes, and take a 30-minute walk or jog each day. It's an inexpensive option for exercising. Work out in your cabin. Setting up a workout routine to do in your cabin is a convenient way to keep yourself healthy. You don't even need workout equipment. Find time to implement these workouts in your daily routine. Push-ups, planks, sit-ups, tricep dips, stretching. Stretching can help avoid back pain. It's important for truckers to make stretching a part of their daily workout routine. Back bends, front bends, side bends, neck stretch. Sleep. Getting a good night's sleep is essential for good health. Driving can become dangerous if you're not getting an appropriate amount of sleep. Studies say that most healthy adults need between 7 and 9 hours of sleep each night. Follow these steps to a happier and healthier sleep lifestyle. Stick to a sleep schedule. Sleep on a comfortable mattress and pillow. Avoid alcohol and caffeine close to bedtime. Turn off all electronics before bed. Mind. Taking care of your mental health should be as important to your physical health. Truck driving can be boring. Keep your mind alert and fresh by listening to music while driving or tncradio.live. This blog on tncradio.live was brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. An Hotshot Secret. We share the science behind common diesel problems. For example, diesel fuel cetane levels. The cetane rating in diesel fuel is 42 to 45. Most diesel engines operate more efficiently with a cetane rating of 48 to 50. One treatment of Hotshot Secret Diesel Extreme will raise your cetane seven points, increase fuel economy, and improve cold starts. Hotshot Secret Diesel Extreme is available nationwide at truck stops. Fine Farm and auto stores and online at hotshotsecret.com. Hotshot Secret, powered by science. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly, and we're talking with Chris Dobbins, who's a flight director at NASA. He's been talking to us a bit about what it's like to work at NASA, work with the space station, uh, communicate with the astronauts, all the different tasks and so forth that go into that. Um, in our previous segment, Chris, you were saying that you interact with the space station and, and you can control their environment, various other things. What is it like for the astronauts up there? I don't know if everyone knows it, but is it a weightless environment or a home away from home? I imagine it's not quite like being on Earth. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question that's near and dear to, I think, a lot of the flight controllers hearts because we're the ones who in mission control we really see the crew's daily life mm -hmm. uh, more than more than a lot of other 
you know, engineers who maybe build or design things that end up on the space station do. Uh, the space station is a, a large complex that orbits about 250 miles above the Earth. It does about a lap every 90 minutes. So it, you switch between daylight and sunlight every 45 minutes. Does mean that all the windows have shutters so that when the astronauts actually want to go to sleep, you know, at their, at their scheduled bedtime that they can turn out all the lights, close the shutters, and they don't have to worry about the, the sun and the shade, you know, changing every 45 minutes on them. Uh, it's, the space station itself is about the size of a football field from solar array to solar array. So that's how much, okay. Uh, space it covers. We have big solar arrays that give us the power we need, much like the, you know, the solar panels you're starting to see on homes and, and things like that around here on the ground. Uh, inside the space station, it, it's built to house seven people. Uh, we do fluctuate between three and about 11, depending on what kind of, you know, logistics we have going on. But normally it's seven people and it's about the same internal space as a six bedroom house, you know, something like a, wow you know, 3,500 square foot house, which is about what you need if you've got seven grown adults uh, sure. trying to live and work. Uh, they, on board, the, the real goal, the mission of the space station is to do science research. The idea is to have uh, an off the planet laboratory where we can do research that no one on earth can do. And specifically, like you mentioned, it's because we have a, a a, effectively a zero gravity environment. There's right. very little gravity, but it's imperceptible to people. Uh, they, they, you don't feel it. So you're floating around in, in three dimensions and working that way. And what that allows us to do is run experiments that you can't run on the ground because you've got to contend with gravity. There, there are things like engine combustion experiments we've done where we've in a safe contained environment on the space station lit things on fire specifically to see how they burn in a in a microgravity environment, and that can teach you a little bit about the physics and the chemistry behind behind that combustion. And it's been used to to try to improve, you know, both you know standard unleaded gasoline engines and, and diesel engines. We've we've done experiments by uh, I think you know motor companies looking for that kind of research, and they can't quite psych something out on the ground, so they send a, a an experiment on board where they can see the flame differently, uh, uh, basically, in, in that environment. So the astronauts are there to, to do that science research for us. They're, they're very well-trained lab technicians, is the way you can, you can kind of think of them. Uh, and from the ground, then, we try to take care of as much as we can so that they can focus on that research. The goal is to have as much time as possible for the astronauts to be doing scientific research for our, our various uh, research projects that are flown from the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the astronauts also, they, they live on the space station for six months, so it's their house. They have the normal chores you would have around the house. They have to you know, unpack bags from uh, cargo vehicles that come up and bring them supplies and you know, refill pantries with food and, and other supplies. They have to clean every weekend. We have an activity for them to go vacuum all of the, the different modules or rooms, basically, in the house. They, they've got to live there. And, and make it home. It also means that they have recreational time. Since they're up there for six months, they can't work you know, 18 hour days for that long. No one can, that's, that's a lot for, for people to do. I'm sure everyone here has done it at one point or another. It's not sustainable for very long. And so we give them uh, some free time on the weekends to call their family uh, using a satellite phone or they have exercise equipment to stay in shape. They can watch movies. We've, we've got an ability to put movies on, you know, laptops and iPads that they can watch on board and, and do things like that. So they have some sense of normalcy. Um, there was a little known fact I ran across, I think it was a year ago or so. Um, the space station has a Houston area code for the, for the phone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. I thought that's that was right. pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah. So you, I'm sure it has something to do with where the phone's registered to, but that's awesome. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So you folks basically monitor everything they're doing, though. Uh, they have to get used to that. What, what does mission control do? Uh, obviously, when you're dealing with the space station, you have pretty normal stuff going on most of the time. It's just keeping record on everything, and uh, they have to account to you on their schedule and what they're doing? Or 
Yeah, so there's a couple different elements of that that Michigan Control is responsible for. So one one you kind of hit on is you know we're responsible for managing their schedule. Uh, so we put together the plan of all of the activities they're going to do, which includes making sure that they have time to eat, that they have time to exercise, that they have time off. You know that if we need them to stay up late to work something, that we let them sleep in the next day, and we manage all of that on the ground. Uh, a lot of crew members, when they come back, actually talk about how it, it takes some reacclimation to planning your own day again because you spent six months where it's all given to you that every minute of your day is, is kind of planned for you, even what time it is to eat. And you get home and you forget to eat because there's no activity on your on your calendar that says it's lunchtime. Uh, we've, we've had crew members say that before. So Michigan Control is planning all of that, which means we're trying to keep track of, you know, the most efficient way to do things, what you know, what constraints exist do you need to, you know, take apart thing A before you can move on to thing B, that that kind of thing. You know, obviously you don't want to be working on working on the exercise equipment when you schedule someone for exercise, right? You, you can't take it apart. Uh, so Mission Control does all that planning for the, the astronauts on board. Uh, we also manage all of the systems. We have a lot of data what we call telemetry that comes to the ground on the health of the space station. And we have the ability to command to a lot of those systems to, you know, turn them on, turn them off, change the speed that a fan is spinning at, change the temperature an air conditioner is blowing at, you know, change the amount of power a solar array is outputting, change the charge rate of a battery, all kinds of things like that, that allows the crew to not have to worry about, you know, how their house is performing if their house is in a good in a good con safe configuration and so we take care of all of that from the ground so it's hopefully transparent to the crew and there's a lot that goes into that because the space station is not only large and complicated it's also kind of a first generation we've flown to space before we've gone to the moon on apollo we've had space shuttle fly 135 times but we've never had an outpost in space that's been up there for 20 years. And so there's a lot of things that just wear, wear out and break and we have to replace them. The ground team is there figuring out how to, how to work with those things. Sure. Chris, uh, you know, America is fascinated by watching the show Big Brother. It's been on for what 20 plus years now and, and everybody's fascinated to watch these people almost like hamsters in a cage and you see every single thing they do within reason and do do the astronauts get a sense of man i'm just i get no sense of privacy the whole time i'm up there or do they hmm. have those moments uh, i i've never it's a, it's a uh i've never directly asked that question it's a really good one of an astronaut but I get the sense that sometimes, yeah, the, the ground having that many people watching everything you're doing is definitely a, an adjustment. You know, all of us are not, all of us here talking here, I've never really experienced the, the level that they do, but we are very intentional about their privacy. You know, one example is that we do have cameras on board and we use the cameras that, that can live downlink video to the ground and we use them to help the astronauts. You know, so if they're working on something uh, you've know, taken a piece of equipment apart for us and they just can't quite figure out what to do next. We might, you know, get a live video link and, and can watch and, and try to say, Hey, why don't you try that instead? But, you know, one example of how we ensure privacy is every day at the end of the day, those cameras, we, we stop routing them to the ground because, okay, it's, it's end of your work day. We don't need to see what's going on now. Sure. It's your space. And, you know, those, those kinds of, we have a lot of practices like that to give them, as much of a sense of privacy as we can on board that yes we're here watching out for you but that's all we're here for we're not here to you know to to you know uh, police you we're, we're here more to, to help and right. so we, we have a lot of little uh tricks like that we we use to to make sure we're not getting too much into their business so they don't feel like they're on a reality show <laughs> that's right that's right that's yeah, right exactly okay cool there's a lot that goes into this. This is fascinating. I know we do have to go to break, so we might as well do that before we delve into another topic here. We're uh, talking with Chris Dobbins. He's a flight director at NASA, and you're listening to the Truckers Network radio show on TNCRadio.live. Stay tuned for more. This is great information, and it's totally fascinating. So stay tuned.
This blog on TNC Radio is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. The five best truck stops in America. Truck drivers spend days, sometimes weeks, out on the road. Sometimes taking a break at a nice truck stop is a great way to relax and take your mind off driving. There are many truck stops across the United States, but we listed the five best truck stops that every trucker needs to stop and experience. Little America, Little America, Wyoming. The Little America Truck Stop is located in Little America, Wyoming. It's a mini-chain truck stop with several locations throughout the country for truckers to enjoy. Little America offers a wide variety of services to truck drivers. Some of the services include service truck roadside repair, tire repair, new tires, wheel seals, oil changes, water pumps, brakes, courtesy property shuttle, AC repairs, belts, DOT inspections, and trailer tarp installation. Iowa 80, Walcott, Iowa. Iowa 80 is a place where truckers want to stop. It's the world's largest truck stop, and it's filled with tons of activities and tourist attractions. Truck drivers could stop and enjoy a nice meal, watch a movie, or stop by the trucking museum. Iowa 80 also has a full range of truck services and amenities. Some of the services and amenities include cat scale, chiropractor, convenience store, interstate dental, dog mat fuel center, laundry facility, library, travel service center, truck mat and a workout room. South of the border, Hammer, South Carolina. Pedro's Truck Stop, also known as Porky's, located in Hammer, South Carolina, is a world-famous roadside attraction for tourists and truck drivers. Pedro's filled with many different activities, unique foods and shopping. It also offers truck drivers supplies, showers, a trucker's lounge, and 24-7 fresh hot coffee. Trails Travel Center. Albert Lee, Minnesota. Trails Travel Center is everything a truck driver needs and amazing food. Some of the Trails Travel Center's food options are a tavern, Cold Stone Creamery, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and McDonald's. Truckers can also stop and shop heavy-duty truck parts or chrome parts. Trails Travel Center also has a truck service that offers drivers wash services, tire services, wheel alignments, and suspension repair. Jubitz, Portland, Oregon. Jubitz is a family-owned truck stop and boasts of being the world's classiest truck stop. They were also recently named the second best rest stop in America. Drivers can enjoy a 24-hour full-service Cascade Grill restaurant, a 100-room hotel, movie theater, barber shop, and more. Jubitz also has a truck service center and is committed to providing truck drivers the best tires, truck maintenance, and truck repair. Some of their services include engine diagnostics, oil change, DOT inspection, glass replacement, metal fabrication, welding, tires, tire service, and airbags, plus brake service, truck trailer alignment, shock absorbers, air conditioning maintenance, electrical diagnostics, battery service, suspension repair, electronic logging devices, lubricant service, APU installation and service. This info blog was brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. This is Alec Demogorski, and you are listening to TNC Radio Live. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly. We're talking with Chris Dobbins, who's a flight director at NASA, and he's been kind of giving us a little bit of an idea of what it's like to work there. Uh, Tom, you said you had a question for Chris. Yeah, Chris, so the, the people who are listening right now are, are uh, moving product people, whatever, all over the United States and Canada, getting a lot of stuff done. And But it's, take for instance, we just had the, the big floods in Kentucky and we've got a, all sorts of logistics are going on right now about how to get the right stuff there at the right time. And they got us thinking as we were getting ready to uh, to talk to you. Um, this must be a logistical maze to try to figure out what needs to go up to the station, when it needs to go, how it's going to go up there, what happens if it doesn't get there, God forbid, you know, for whatever reason. And, you know, all these kinds of things. How does all of that kind of come together? So and, and you're talking to people who kind of do this. And I'm sure look at this as kind of an amazing, like, take what we do to the next degree, you know? Yeah, I, I, I really love that question because it's not, it's not one I've ever answered before, but it got me thinking about just to, to your point, yeah, how kind of incredible it is that it does come together and that, you know, we've never run out of something as simple as food or water on board the space station because of the, you know, incredible people on the ground who I don't 
uh, serve this function, but we have you know, an office of, of people that's responsible for those logistics, for coordinating those logistics. And then of course, there are all the, all the people, you know, boots on the ground to who are doing that logistics, you know, whether it's uh, building spare equipment or delivering that equipment from point A to point B before it gets to a rocket. And so just to kind of give you a high level of how it works is, you know, we've got uh, a large, uh, engineering, sustaining engineering organization that goes and figures out, you know, what do I need to keep a space station alive? And uh, you can kind of think of the space station like a, you know, almost like a forward operating post or an outpost at the end of a, of a long, uh, you know, train line or a long, uh, you know, trail, uh, uh, the, the furthest point that anyone has settled at this point. And so, they aren't providing anything back to us yet. We're only providing up to, to them. You know, of course, they're doing great research, but they're not providing product back for the most part, um, uh, other than a few experiments that get returned for, for ground analysis. But the, you know, the, the engineering organization goes and figures out what we need to keep that up and running. And then there are uh, various factories Throughout the United States, the ISS program is actually supported, I believe, by all 50 states. And if it's not 50, it's really close. There are factories everywhere that build the piece parts we need, you know, the this, this spare equipment so that when something, you know, a pump breaks on board, we can replace the pump. There, there's people who, you know, put all the food packaging together so that we've got food on board, get the water to the right quality, bagged up into, you know, the containers and put, put, so we can put it on board the space station. All that then gets shipped to our kind of our our uh, depot hub, which is at in in Florida at Cape Canaveral at Kennedy Space Center, where we kind of gather all of this stuff. Uh, there's a there's a depot of spare parts there actually, where where things we know that will break are sitting in a in a big warehouse, so that we can launch them when we need them, and they sit at at you know just a few miles down the road from the launch pad. And when we need to put them on those things on a rocket, they get loaded on a rocket and they go to the space station. Of course, the logistics part is really challenging because rockets are we're not stable enough where we just launch them on demand. We've got flight schedule of okay, there's going to be a cargo mission in a you know in a few weeks that goes up, and then a crewed vehicle bringing new astronauts up, and that one can only carry so much cargo, whereas your cargo vehicle carries this much. And so that whole logistical game of figuring out what goes on what vehicle, what's critical to get up now versus what can wait, that all occurs. And of course, I've seen in, in, you know, in my career cases where something was out of factory in California, for example, and needed to get to the space station for a launch in you know, 24 hours. So it gets overnighted from California to the Cape and loaded on a rocket that launches the next day. You know, that kind of thing absolutely has happened before. Uh, and, and so there's just a big logistical engine that drives making sure the end user, the astronauts, have what they need before they need it. You definitely would have to plan. Oh, my goodness. That, that's quite involved. <laughs> How often are there deliveries, if you will, to the space station? Space yeah, station? yeah. There are a few different cargo vehicles that NASA uses, uh, and then the Japanese and Russian space agencies also have uh, a cargo vehicle each. Those cargo trucks, cargo trucks, I'm, I'm using my air quotes, uh, the, the, cargo, the cargo vehicles have, um, you know, a few thousand pounds of, of delivery capability, and those go up every, uh, there's about one every one to three months, and it kind of just depends on how we've laid out the schedule. So there's three to five a year, I would say, of of just supply runs and, and those cargo vehicles don't have any astronauts on them. They're all flown autonomously with some ground control and they go, you know, dock or, or attach the space station. And then the, the astronauts can you know, open a hatch and go inside and, and unload all of the cargo. And then a couple of the, the cargo vehicles there, they don't return to earth. They burn up in the atmosphere intentionally after they leave the space station. And so those that burn up, we load with as much trash as we can pack in because of course there's nowhere easy to get rid of trash when you're on a, on a space station. Sure. sure. Yeah. So does this have to be done at a certain time of year or does the space station have to be um, at a certain place above the earth to be able to dock? Uh, 
So typically, uh, there are timing constraints, but there's usually, and, and this is a generally speaking, a launch opportunity every 24 hours from all of our launch sites. And that can okay. vary a little bit depending on time of year, like you're saying, but it's usually in the 24 hour range. So, which makes it really nice if, you know, if there's bad weather, thunderstorms in Florida, that, that of course happens all the time. Sure. We can, you know, just slip 24 hours and try again the next day to launch. And, and usually it's not a problem. So, um, the availability is there uh, year round for the most part. And it's really just the logistics of building the rocket, loading the rocket with all of the, the supplies and then and then launching it. You, you know, Chris, you've given us a, a lot of great NASA type information. Now I wanna ask some Chris information here. There are so, <laughs> right. many, cool, there's so many cool things going on right now with the, the telescope, Artemis and, uh, um, you know, changes that are coming in our relationship with some of the other. What is standing out to you right now that you find like this is just so cool? This is, you know, something that we're doing that you're you're personally really excited about with NASA. Yeah, so I was born in, uh, you know, only I'm only 30 years old, so I was not born for I was not alive for the the moon landings, and I've never seen, you know, man or woman walk on the moon. Uh, there, there's certainly a generation that's still still alive that has seen that and i am really excited to see people back on the moon i i personally just believe that humans you know, are meant to explore you know we're always looking over that next horizon and you know the next horizon to me is is you know it's the moon and then eventually to mars and so i'm really excited for our artemis program and the missions we're going to do with that and artemis is just what we're calling our, our moon missions, where we're going to put people on the surface of the moon again, hopefully in the next few years. Um, so I'm just really excited to see with my own eyes, not through a recorded video from 50 years ago, 60 years ago now, yeah. uh, almost six years ago, to see people on the moon again. And, and you know, the other awesome thing we're doing with it this time is, you know, a lot of what happened in the 60s was to, you uh, you know, just get get there before the Russians could get there because it was a, it was a matter of national security. And, right. and this time we're going with international partners. You know, we've signed on 15 or 16 different countries, something like that, to the Artemis Accords. So we're going uh, as, you know, as planet Earth and not just as the United States. And That's also cool. to see, see us stay. We're talking, you know, how do we build a space station out by the moon? How do we build a base on the surface of the moon? Right. And I'm excited to see people living on the moon for months at a time. Yeah, I'd heard that there's a place on the moon they discovered has uh, temperature consisted at 60 degrees. Had you? That's interesting. Yeah. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. I know that there's there's ice water on the moon at mm -hmm. the poles. Yeah, and I know that that's one of the things we plan to try to take advantage of because if you don't have to carry your water with you, that's one less problem you have to solve. But yeah, as Forrest Gump would say, one less thing. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, w w that's cool. Yeah, and I agree. I'm I'm really looking forward to all the moon stuff, and hopefully, in my oh. lifetime, we might get up to Mars. Uh, I I did. Uh, I am of the age that I do remember when man landed on the moon. I was sitting there watching that with my family, and of course, I've, like you have seen it on recordings and all that kind of stuff. But I'm anxious to see it again while it's happening. Absolutely, and. You know, so kind of to, to run with that, I'll, I'll plug my, uh, my the, the thing I'm most excited for soon is at the end of, end of this month, NASA is going to try to launch our first Artemis mission. It will be a test mission. We're just flying the rocket and the spacecraft the crew will use to get to the moon. We're calling it Artemis 1. Mm -hmm. There won't be anyone on board because it'll be the first time any of this has flown. So we want to make sure it's safe before we we stick you know human lives on board and it'll go out to the moon and and do a few laps out in the vicinity of the moon for about uh anywhere from four to six weeks depending on when we launch and then it'll return and we're gonna get a lot of really good data about what kind of spacecraft we have and how safe it is to fly and we'll i'm sure you know as a person who sits in mission control i know we're going to learn a lot about just how the thing works in, in flight, because there's only so much you can get from testing sure. in a lab on the right. ground. Sure. But yeah. that'll be that'll be really exciting, and it'll be the first flight of the 
Space Launch System rocket, which is the biggest rocket we've built since Apollo. So, you know, someone who likes loud booms and <laughs> lots of excitement, that'll be that'll be cool to watch. Yeah. Uh, even though I'll just be watching on TV, most likely, I'm still excited. I, I was what role? He, oh, I, I was just going to ask what role Houston was going to play in in all of that. Yeah. So, so Houston Mission Control will be controlling that flight, um, the same as we would for any any crew any crew mission so i won't be in the control room for that one but uh several of my colleagues will be uh you know the, the same types of people that fly iss will be flying this vehicle and since there's no crew on board they'll be kind of the the, the go-to for all of the all the commands and changes that need to happen on board that we can do remotely from from the ground just amazing that all of this technology and how it coordinates i mean it, and it's so much easier than it was when people landed on the moon and they were using slide rulers, weren't they at that point? That's right. Yeah. The, the com, <laughs> you know, the thing, the common thing that we joke about is the computer that took up a, you know, a, a full first floor of a building is less powerful than the average cell phone today. Yeah. And that's what they got to the moon on was something less powerful than a cell phone. Yeah. It's kind we of certainly scary. have a lot more capability now. Yeah. It's scary oh, yeah, too. Yeah. We have to go to break here. I know Tom and I have a lot more questions to ask you. We're talking with Chris Dobbins. He's a flight director at NASA. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio Live. Stay tuned for more coming up. This info blog on TNC Radio Live is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. Six things to consider before starting your career in trucking. Truck drivers are often referred to as the backbone of America. They haul roughly 70% of America's freight. Nearly every good consumed in the United States has been shipped by a truck. Right now, the demand for truck drivers is higher than ever. The growing truck driver shortage in America is a topic of concern and has been for the past four years. The United States is in dire need of people to start driving trucks. Are you considering becoming a truck driver, but not quite sure if it's the career path for you? Here are six things potential truck drivers need to know before starting their career in the trucking industry. Know your why. Why do I want to become a truck driver? Is one of the first questions you should ask yourself before starting your career in trucking. Knowing and understanding your why is important so that you make sure that trucking is something you'll enjoy. Nothing is more draining than working in a career field that you're not passionate about and excited about. Truck drivers are already more likely to struggle with mental health problems because of the trucking lifestyle. So to avoid dreading your trucking career, ask yourself, why do I want to be a truck driver? Long work hours. It's obvious that truck drivers spend a majority of their workday in the driver's seat, but many new drivers don't realize how hard it can be sitting for long periods. Drivers spend hours upon hours sitting down. This can result in leg, back, and neck pain. If you're the type of person who cannot handle sitting down for several hours at a time, then truck driving is not for you. Another thing to consider is how long a typical workday is for a truck driver. Drivers are legally allowed to work 14 hours a day, but are limited to 11 hours of driving time. They must take a mandatory 30-minute break by the 8th hour of duty. Following the long workday, drivers must have 10 hours of off-duty time. In a work week, drivers cannot exceed more than 60 hours of work or 70 hours over eight days. Failure to follow these HOS rules can result in being shut down, fines, and lower carrier safety ratings. A new lifestyle. There's not a career quite like trucking. It's nothing like your typical 9 to 5 Monday through Friday job. It's long hours, days, and most times weeks away from home. Truck drivers often experience loneliness, depression, and anxiety. If you're someone who's used to working with many people, then truck driving will be a shock. Drivers will go days or weeks without seeing their loved ones, and it can really take a toll on truckers, especially those who are new. Adjusting to this lifestyle can be challenging at first, but once you do, you can live a rewarding life as a truck driver. Getting seat time. The more experience you have as a truck driver, the better. With more experience, you'll land better truck driving jobs and better pay. 
According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, truck drivers earn an average of over $40,000 a year. Yet, many trucking companies advertise higher rates of pay for experienced drivers. Over time, you can negotiate a higher rate per mile. Your relationships will suffer. It doesn't matter if you're on the road or at home. Make time for family. Make it a priority to talk to someone in your family once a day. It can be tough for truckers, especially long-haul truck drivers, to maintain relationships with their families due to the trucking lifestyle. Keeping in contact with your loved ones will help life on the road be less lonely. Lack of sleep Getting the recommended amount of sleep each night is a rare thing for truckers. Although sleep may be difficult for truckers because of the uncomfortable way of living, it's essential to their well-being and safety. Make it a priority to get good sleep and make a sleep schedule. Set an alarm for a certain time and turn off all electronics and get your much-needed sleep. Not getting enough sleep makes life on the road miserable. Although there may seem like many downsides, truck driving can be a very rewarding and exciting career. As a truck driver, you have freedom on the open road and the chance to see America's most beautiful places. For information on trucking, be sure to check out the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net Truckers Life Radio from TFC Global with your host Ron Frazier every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. On the show, Ron interviews guests to help inform professional drivers just like you about the importance of things like human trafficking to sex addiction to how to overcome the impossible odds on the way to success. Every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly. We're talking with Chris Dobbins, who's a flight director at NASA. In our previous segment, we were talking about Artemis. Tom, you said you had another question for Chris. Yeah, Chris, uh, I asked you this offline, but uh, kind of for everybody's sake. Artemis, how, how it compares to Saturn V. I was asked that question during our morning show today, and I had no clue. So size-wise, how, how does Artemis compare yeah, to Saturn V? That's a really good question. So the, the rocket we'll be using for Artemis is called the Space Launch System. And it looks a little bit like a Saturn V met a space shuttle tank and solid rocket booster and 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 decided to, to build a rocket that way. Um, it's, it's pretty similar to the Saturn V in terms of some of the capability, uh, though the first version we're going to fly is going to be a little bit smaller and a little bit less capable than Saturn V, but close. And, and some of that just has to do with the, the engineering test data we want out of the flight and, and the way that the design is, has been made. But future versions of, of uh, the SLS or Space Launch System will be a little bit bigger than the Saturn V as we grow the design and, and uh, you know, plan to evolve it after we get some test data. And so it, it'll be pretty comparable, but but just a, a little bit a little bit smaller and then a little bit bigger. You know, once we get a handful of flights in, you know, by the fourth or fifth flight or so, it'll start to grow. Fascinating. What do you sitting in missions control as much as you've had? You've seen a lot of people come in and get the little tour and that, that, that kind of stuff. But what do you think is the thing that surprises people the most when they get to see missions control up close? So in the context in which I've seen people in mission control the most, it's working a space station shift on, you know, a Saturday afternoon and it's maybe two or three o'clock and, you know, someone's on vacation and they're coming through with a friend or, or family member to, to see mission control. And the thing that always, I think, strikes people the most is that for the last 20 years, we've had continuous human presence in space. There's always been at least three people living off the earth in a space station for 20 years, uh, almost, I think it's 21 years now. And, and which means too, for a lot of the, the kids that come in, that's their entire lifetime. You know, there, there's, you know, all the way from, you know, birth to, to middle of college age now, you know, high school for sure. People who've never known a world in which there's not at least a few humans in space. And that's the part that really blows people away just that humans are capable of that now, uh, mm -hmm. especially you know, with all the kind of crazy things going on, on on earth. It seems that there's always something um, 
divisive or crazy. It's just this idea that we can come together to do things that look as challenging as that. We've come a long way since the Wright brothers, and they told them that would never work. You know? That's right. <laughs> That's right. And even when people landed on the moon, there were a lot of naysayers saying, why are you doing that? You know, uh, why did you just stay on Earth? <laughs> One of the yeah, things. And, and that's a totally, you know, it's a great question, too, because what we're doing is, you know, taxpayer funded, you know, NASA is not um, privately, privately funded by, you know, a, a gracious donor or anything like that. So we're spending, you know, all of our money in the United States to go do these things. So it's a good question to ask. But, you know, really what NASA is doing is, is enabling advancement both on earth and beyond by exploring you know every time humans mm -hmm. push that boundary just a little bit further we seem to learn something that we didn't know yep. that we can use both to improve the the people running behind us as well as to think forward for how we're going to use that next horizon and so you know just by by pushing that envelope you know i'm sure all of you have come across at one point or another a nasa spin-off you know things oh, sure. like yeah but uh, there, there's so many things that, that have come from NASA research that by solving it for space, we solve it back on Earth. You know, one of the great examples is just the way computers exploded after the Apollo landing. You know, computers didn't exist really in the way that we know them until NASA decided they needed one to get to the moon. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, there's a lot of other research and development around that, but really a catalyst was going to the moon. Necessity is the mother of invention, and we certainly benefited. What was it, Velcro? That came out of the space program. Velcro is another good one, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, and medical technologies benefited from what's done on the space station. I mean, there are benefits all over the place. That's right, and, you know, for the space station, one of the one of the big buckets of research that we do is, is human research, you know, collecting data on the astronauts, and we have – you know, learned things by, by collecting that data that apply back to Earth just because the body responds a little bit differently when you change the environment. So take away gravity, something different happens. And sure. you know, there are numerous research papers written about that that have helped advance, you know, things like surgical techniques on the ground or mm -hmm. medicine development on the ground because of those things that we've learned. Hasn't it helped with stimulating bone growth and that sort of thing? Because I know bone density tests have been done on astronauts and no gravi gravity settings because that actually can cause the bone to degrade, I believe. That's right. I don't know the specific research that has been done on, you know, earth facing, but I do know that we've spent a lot of energy doing exactly what you said and measuring, measuring bone density of astronauts on board because we know that it does change when your bones are not under the stress of having to walk around all day mm -hmm. you know, they, they start to they start to atrophy and the cells in your bones go you know why bother growing i don't need to do yeah. anything anymore and so i know we've done a lot to to try to understand that to help life back on earth yeah it, it's been a huge benefit it sounds like you had a question tom yeah chris i i didn't realize until i was talking to shelly about all this a couple of days ago that not everybody in america has nasa tv on their cable system that's right. And so, hopefully, so is NASA TV something people can get on the Internet and watch if they want to? That's right. Uh, NASA TVs, you can find it in a number of spots. The easiest thing to do is just Google it, and the first five links will take you to a bunch of different places to get it. Um, NASA's website has a live stream of NASA TV. There are other websites like YouTube that carry the, the stream straight from the NASA feed. Uh, so it's really easy to find if you just punch it into your favorite search engine. And uh, the cool thing about that is there's always something on, and then anytime something exciting happens, NASA TV will carry it live. So for example, the Artemis launch at the end of the month will definitely be on NASA TV. Uh, anytime there's a, a cargo or a crewed vehicle going to the space station, we, we, take, we, we put it out on NASA TV. And uh, you know, of course, too, it gets replayed on the same stream or channel so that you can watch it if you miss it. There's plenty of opportunities to watch. Fantastic. This, this has been just fascinating, Chris. Um, I think we could talk for a couple more hours on exactly what goes into NASA and what a flight director does. There's so much there, and it is, it's just fascinating. It really is like sci-fi movies, for real. This has been That's fun. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I've enjoyed it, too. Thank you.
We've been talking with Chris Dobbins. He's a flight director at NASA. Um, we have about 20 seconds. What's a good website for people to check out NASA? If you start at nasa.gov, you can go pretty much anywhere from there. NASA TV, I think, is linked up top. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of other cool resources to learn about Artemis and what we're doing on the space station. You can find pretty much anything you want from there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for listening to another great interview on TNC Radio.Live and the Truckers Network Radio Show. All of the material you hear on TNC Radio.Live on our website, our broadcasts, or our podcasts are copyrighted. There can be no distribution without the express consent of TNC Radio.Live and its partners. For inquiries, write us at info at TNC Radio.Live. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast of the Truckers Network Radio Show. 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 Truckers Network Radio Show.